speculation had become crazy. Once you swallow the bounce into this bottle, you have eaten so much stuff. You just turn this one dial. The most powerful nootropic I've ever taken. Only Legere in America Nicotine Industry is making the world's most powerful nootropic. Only Legere in America Nicotine Industry is making the world's most powerful nootropic. Only Legere in America Nicotine Industry is making the world's most powerful nootropic. Only Legere in America Nicotine Industry is making the world's most powerful nootropic. Bacon until you make it. Now is the time to buy. And then all of a sudden you change the world. Go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. Doing what you want to do in life is like being on vacation every single day. Welcome to Griftonomics. So you might have heard more and more recently about carbon offsetting with companies labeling their products as carbon neutral or airlines allowing you to offset the emissions of your ticket with a one time fee. Carbon credits, the financial system behind this movement, are becoming big business, with billions of dollars in credits traded last year alone. But how much oversight do these markets have? And can you be guaranteed that your carbon is actually being offset when you pay the airline that extra fee? To help us answer these questions, we're joined today by Polly Hemming, advisor to the Australia Institute for their climate and energy program. Thanks for joining today, Polly. Thanks very much. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I think just for everybody, it would be great if uh, you could just introduce yourself and kind of the focus of your work. Yeah, sure. So uh, the Australia Institute is an independent public policy think tank, uh, and we cover sort of a range of policy issues in Australia, um, democracy, accountability, economics, obviously climate and energy, where I'm based. And my work in particular focuses on the efficacy and the regulation of carbon markets, predominantly in Australia, but increasingly globally as well as Australia kind of steps into a um, kind of more global, global environment yeah. in the Asia Pacific in particular with its carbon offsetting. Nice. Um, and now that, that the Paris Agreement's been resolved. So, so yeah, I look at carbon markets, uh, climate integrity, and greenwashing, both by the government and the private sector. You're an Australian, you know that uh, yeah. our government at times has been a little bit creative with the truth when it comes to climate. And um, actually, prior to this, I was working in government in a carbon oh. neutral certification scheme that promoted carbon offsetting by big business, big business, sorry, um, Qantas being one of them. So I've kind of been on both sides of these things, both a greenwasher uh, and <laughs> now atoning for greenwashing. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know if it's just my bias, but um, as an Australian, but a lot, I, there seems to be a lot of people talking about climate from Australia um, that that I follow on Twitter as well. Is, is there just a, a lot of climate stuff happening in Australia? Well, there is. We've just had an election, and mm -hmm. we'd kind of been, I guess, held to ransom by uh, the incumbent government for ten years. Uh, mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. I think it's it's fairly reasonable to say was is. A, a, has been a climate denier and sort of very mm -hmm. active in subsidising fossil fuels and blocking climate policy. So the what was kind of overwhelming about this election, um, that the coalition government was, was voted out, was that people were actually voting for climate action. So we've just had three years of fairly devastating fires, then floods, then more floods, yep. you know, hailstorms. <laughs> Australians are living climate change now and I think that it was kind of abundantly clear yeah. excuse me in in the outcome of this election so that's probably why people are talking about it and now sense, you know not yeah. just talking about it yeah yeah now saying okay so where's the action we voted for this um bring yeah, it right before the pandemic kicked off I was uh, in December of 2019 back in Australia visiting and it was when those fires those big fires happened and it was just it was it really kind of just set the stage you're kind of like wow this is what what climate catastrophe is is going to look like it was it was shocking to me um to yeah ab absolutely yeah i i was um my, my family and i were trapped in those fires and and evacuated and that coincided with me leaving the job that i spoke about before and mm. and really kind of doing something actually awesome that, that was not going to obstruct and actually make a difference hopefully Cool. So uh, getting back to the topic, most people have probably heard of the term carbon offsetting. I think it gets thrown around a lot. I've started to see it pop up more and more. As I was saying, you know, airlines now offer it as this convenient little thing you can add when you buy a plane ticket. Um, but could you help the average person just understand what carbon offsetting really is? Yeah, sure. It, carbon offsetting is 
in theory and at its most basic, a way to compensate for putting CO2 or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So to say you're running a business um, and burning diesel from running your truck, which produces CO2, mm -hmm. and you're feeling kind of bad about that, but you can't actually afford to transition to, say, an electric vehicle, you might decide that you want to do something about the, the impact that those emissions from your truck are having. So, mm -hmm. um yeah, you, you could buy an electric truck, which would produce no emissions, or you can keep running your truck and trying to compensate for those emissions by investing in a CO2 reduction project or a greenhouse gas reduction project somewhere else in the economy. So you, you might be a project over here. I know this is a podcast, but I'm gesturing to my right. <laughs> that there's a project, you know, somewhere here in Australia that's doing something like planting trees, which of course sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere or um, somewhere else someone's building a wind farm that generates electricity and of course that's not sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere but it's avoiding CO2 being emitted when electricity is um, generated from burning coal. So effectively you pay these projects to keep operating so that you can keep polluting and in theory the two cancel each other out. So it's like the CO2 from your truck was never emitted and mm -hmm. there's there's some principles to how these projects should run, these offset projects. Um, it actually, to go back, there's principles to how you should offset in the first place. So it's something mm -hmm. really you should only do as a last resort and mm -hmm. something that's limited to really small sectors of the economy, what we call the hard to abate sectors. And those are the sectors that we don't really have a way to decarbonize yet in our economy, like steel, cement, agriculture, chemicals. Right. Um, <clears throat> And what you should be doing is offsetting at the same time as transitioning. So you're saving up to buy your EV. You're not saying this is my business solution now just to keep offsetting and keep running my truck. Right. Makes um, sense. Yeah. 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 And the, the projects that you invest in are meant to have some principles too. So mm -hmm. firstly, they actually have to rem remove or reduce emissions and you'd mm -hmm. be surprised at how many don't. So <laughs> just want to really want to spell that, that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Secondly, they have to be permanent. So it has to obviously be a permanent reduction. Um, the tree mm -hmm. you've planted has to have a, a period of, of 100, 25 to 100 years generally um, of, of growing and staying and holding that gotcha. carbon. Um, and there's this other, there's other principles, but a really important one is that the project has to be additional. And what I mean by that is that the project wasn't going to happen anyway. Um, the only way this tree planting or wind project exists is due to that investment or the incentive of earning money from carbon credits. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it should work. Um, all things being perfect, that's how it looks in a textbook. Unfortunately, that's really how it does work. So once a tonne of CO2 or, or methane or other greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, the, the impact that those gases have is immediate. Right. And then the projects that you're investing in to offset that, there, there's no guarantee that the projects you're investing in are actually doing what they say or that the reduction is permanent. So the trees you invested in to keep running your truck might burn down, which right. that happened in California recently. So, uh -huh. so not only have you emitted your greenhouse gas, but the, the greenhouse gas that was allegedly stored yeah. Um, has now been released as well. It's kind of like so an IOU, but the you know, there's no real guarantee that the you know those trees will be around for forever. Well, exactly, yeah, and that's actually you've just highlighted a really important issue. Um, we we are all living in a changing climate. Mm -hmm. Places that are heavily forested now are drying out. Uh, soils losing carbon, so our changing climate is actually changing what these forests that are planted now or, or not cut down now are going to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big issue with a lot of carbon credit, sorry, Makes carbon sense. offsets. And, and I think so, we'll get so on to So you mentioned to, the to, word carbon yeah. credit a few times. Can you mm. just, so carbon offsetting is this kind of, I'll, I'll plant a tree so that you can keep polluting and then, you know, but the, the credit is the way that that is kind of facilitated. Can you maybe just explain what a carbon credit is. And I know that there are kind of broadly some different types of carbon credits as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, the credit is a way of unitizing that offsetting activity mm -hmm. that you are carrying out. So it's a certificate that represents one metric ton of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent. So we, we kind of um, 
break down all the different greenhouse gases into carbon dioxide equivalents mm-hmm. just for the sake of simplicity. Yeah. And credits are issued by carbon credit standards or certifying bodies. So they're either government bodies or commercial standards. And those bodies say, here are the rules for carrying out an offset project. <clears throat> and then mm-hmm. you go off and you do that project and the certifying body comes and looks at it and says, yeah, cool, okay, you've carried out the project according to those rules, you've met those criteria, some of which I just mentioned, you know, okay, this project looks like it's permanent, um, it's transparent, it's additional, um, mm-hmm. there's a few others. Here's a carbon credit for, for this tonne or, or tonnes that you've um, stored or avoided. You can now go and sell those carbon credits and then when someone buys that carbon credit and uses it to offset a ton of their pollution, they have to do something called retiring it. So, so carbon credits are all listed in a registry, um, yeah. which is something just, just hold that in your head. Cause that's important when we talk later about um, putting credits on blockchain there, we do actually have registries for carbon credits already. Okay. You have to, the person who's using that carbon credit to justify emitting the ton of, of greenhouse gas crosses it off that registry. So it can't be used to cancel out a, another ton of, of pollution. See, okay. Gotcha. Okay. And the, the, there, there's a mix, right. Of, of in some, some governments, I believe mandate or, or put caps on, on the amount of emissions and credits are somehow generated through that. But then there's also voluntary programs, right. As well. Can you maybe, maybe just help spell out the, the delineation of those. Yeah, sure. Uh, quite often the credits used under each system are the same. There's two types of carbon markets. There's this regulatory compliance market that you've just alluded to, and then there's the voluntary market. And, and the both together in the world estimated to be have a value of about a um, trillion dollars US. So wow. compliance markets are used. Yeah, it's, oh, it's bonkers. Compliance markets are used by companies and governments by law that have to account for their emissions. Mm-hmm. So kind of it's some sort of regulatory or or mandatory carbon reduction regimes. And, and so you have things like, you know, the, the EU emissions trading scheme. Um, there's others in the world too. There's um, China has just mm-hmm. started the bi- world's biggest um, compliance carbon market. And so the main buyers of carbon credits under those schemes are those big emitters that fall under the compliance markets. And you're right, um, Compliance markets usually only allow some types of credits. Uh-huh. So um, I think, for example, nature-based credits aren't allowed under some of those compliance markets for the reasons we mentioned before, like just because they're too fraught, too hard to measure and, and the lack gotcha. of permanence. But then you've got this voluntary market, which is significantly smaller, and that's used by companies or NGOs or, or um, you know, subnational governments even to meet voluntary climate targets mm-hmm. and it's as i said significantly smaller it's valued currently at about a billion dollars but there's lots of uh, really optimistic projections about its growth yeah. that put it at a value of about 20 billion by 2030 okay yeah it does and, seem to be growing like the so yeah that's that's a good segue into like who are the the main buyers and sellers like the, the one you know one thing that I was wondering is if, if if there's two big emitters, for instance, and and one of them, you know, is is doing well on their kind of cap or or however much they're allowed to to emit, um, but they come in under, are they able to sell what they didn't as a credit to another big emitter to kind of level it out, or, or how does how does that work? Yeah, that's that's what happens in emissions trading schemes. Mm-hmm. That's not what so that's what happens in the EU that's not what happens uh in the voluntary carbon market gotcha. so there's there's different types of you know you have these these cap and trade schemes like yeah. that uh and then you have um baseline and credit schemes which is basically where you just buy you can buy fundamentally an unlimited amount of carbon offsets okay as opposed it, to who's an allowance those? which is who's buying those under so under the those compliance schemes, obviously, it's the big emitters. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on the program, so in Australia, we have, well, I'll use Australia as a case study. Sure. Yeah. We have a compliance market, but we don't have those allowances under the cap. Mm. If, if I'll just explain it really quickly. We have 
big emitters have limits set on them and if they exceed those limits then they have to buy carbon credits so it's mm. it's slightly different as in then they're not staying under a cap and then being able to trade the allowances that I looks see. like something that maybe happened in australia but no if they exceed it they buy carbon credits to offset the excess mm -hmm. Um, private project developers supply both markets, the compliance market and the voluntary market. Um, in terms of the biggest buyers, again, using Australia as a case study, and I suspect this, this is probably kind of um, is relevant globally, the biggest buyers of carbon credits are fossil fuel companies and investors. So you'll see lots of commentary um, on every story or web page about <laughs> carbon credits that says, oh, corporates are like setting ambitious climate targets after COP and, and yeah. they're racing to net zero and like just aren't, aren't they great? But actually it's the big polluters who are buying carbon credits um, mm. to meet compliance obligations in Australia, uh, especially because they've exceeded their pollution limits or they know that they're going to expand their business. So they're purchasing carbon credits for future compliance reasons mm -hmm. or else they're buying a small number of credits to greenwash their grass and electricity products. And then the other predominant buyers are investors buying up credits speculatively. So it's not actually anyone who's legitimately reducing their emissions uh, or, or legitimately transitioning to clean, clean energy in those hard to abate sectors. Yeah, it's big emitters really who don't want yeah. to change their business. I want to well. talk about the speculation in a minute. So the, but 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 just on the on the sellers then. So you, there's a, there's a lot of buy demand. It sounds like people that that want to you know be able to keep polluting and, and but feel good about it or greenwash their image you know it blows my mind that a company like shell could say that they're going to be carbon neutral in the future right but um the sellers like especially in, in the voluntary programs like who who are these people you mentioned private programs like who who are the people that are setting up these private programs and how are they doing kind of the baselining and the benchmarking to calculate how much carbon is actually being offset and is there like regulation around that or could the kind of you know the books be cooked a little bit there to make it seem like they're offsetting more yeah it's an excellent question um it, it's hard to know exactly who the project developers are um globally you know i can i can tell you the three biggest ones in australia mm. but when i talk about sort of these frameworks and accrediting standards governments will have their own accrediting standards. So Australia does, I won't go into that because it's a bit of a mess, but in this voluntary market, we have these really big carbon credit frameworks that are self-regulated and they're the ones who are setting the standard, you know, have the benchmark markers, sorry, benchmarks, mm -hmm. and uh who can recommend, you know, private verifiers and auditors of projects. The problem is, is that there's not a lot of transparency. Some are better than others. The, the world's biggest carbon credit voluntary framework, um, VERA, or, or voluntary carbon standards that used to be known, uh, really, I think, has an inadequate amount of transparency um, around its methods mm -hmm. and if you look around the world at the number of projects it's kind of let through uh, those sort of the standards that you are mentioning seem to me to be largely non-existent um, and there is no regulation that the whole industry is entirely self-regulated which <laughs> great always works well there is a you know there's sort of been attempts there's this body that was called the voluntary task force for scaling carbon voluntary carbon markets or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is attempting to provide a bit of oversight over to this, that A, scale the market, but that, but then, you know, set some integrity standards. But again, you know, it's, it's predominantly self-regulated. There's no government or, or UN body overseeing this whole system, this global right. voluntary system of carbon credits saying, hey, that's not really cool. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you you can you can pretty much just pick a project out of the out of a hat and interrogate it enough, and you will find issues with it. Yeah, the two words self regulation are very kind of scary to me, especially as it's to dealing with the the climate. I was I was watching a video earlier about a case study. I think it was in India where they had uh, a bunch of carbon credits were sold um, based off. Uh, 
kind of replacing old cook stoves with a new type of cook stove that was more efficient, used, you know, emitted less carbon. Um, mm. And that was based on like laboratory results or something. So they sold all the carbon credits, but then a, a year later, they when they actually ran the data and they looked at the the carbon, you know, emissions, they realized that just just inefficiencies and in people cooking more, for instance, and things like that in the real world actually meant it wasn't anywhere near the the offset that was sold. So that do people do the sellers not have to actually come back, you know, five or 10 years later and be like, Oh, yeah, that it was actually offset. Like, is it just kind of a trust me? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much kind of a trust me thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, that that you've just mentioned one of the other principles that offsets should have, which is leakage, um, and that's the the reduction that that this project is resulting in shouldn't result in an increase elsewhere. It's very hard to get the balance of all these integrity principles. Um, so you you find things like um, for, for forests are being protected where they're and earning carbon credits where they were never actually going to be cut down. Um, wow. in the first place. Um, it, yeah, it's it's appalling. And that's not limited to these voluntary frameworks. So again, using Australia as an example, nominally our carbon credits are regulated by government, but unfortunately the carbon industry and the fossil fuel industry are actually, they actually get involved in designing the carbon credit methods that are built into our legislation. So we have this mm in inverted commas, co-design process where we invite industry to design the carbon credit methods that are going to benefit them both as suppliers and buyers. Uh, and I don't know if you follow this stuff in Australia, but we had someone who used to be involved in this system come out last year revealing that 80% of Australia's carbon credits are not real or not additional. And that's a voluntary, like what is <laughs> pitched as, as one of the most robust schemes in the world. So if we're not getting it right here, like we've got a whole department dedicated to this, mm -hmm. if we're not getting it right here and it's being rorted, you know, I, it just really raises so many questions about the, the voluntary market. And um, I mean, the, the clean development mechanism, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, that came out of the Kyoto Protocol. This is like a global compliance carbon market. And we'll have another mm -hmm. one that comes out of Paris. But, you know, I think it's something like, only a third of the money that was meant to go to projects on the ground actually ended up going on the ground. You know, the rest went to, to middle people um, yeah. and investors. Uh, I, some, I don't have the numbers at, at, to hand, but, you know, I'll just take a stab. 70% of something of clean de development mechanism projects uh, didn't end up being additional or real. Wow. So it just we just remain undeterred because there's so much money um in this system that that we just persevere and it's not like you know you're talking about you've got to come back years later and and see if this was actually permanent one of the grifts if you want to talk about yeah. that is that you can't see co2 right, right so if, right, right, right. if you're selling tvs it's abundantly clear if you try and pass off a shoebox that's covered in cellophane to a buyer and say this is a tv like hang it on the wall of your pub and people can watch Fox Sports and you'll get more customers. Like mm -hmm. the, the buyer's going to go, yeah, mate, that's not a TV. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. So the, the, the seller is actually kind of beholden to produce an actual product of quality. Yeah. Similarly, if that buyer goes, yeah, actually that's a really good deal. That's only a dollar for that TV in inverted commas. I'll take that back to my bar and hang it on the wall and my customers can watch sport. Like your customers are going to say, that's not a TV <laughs> norm. You've just bought a shoebox with cellophane. I'm not coming to this bar to watch sport. Do, do you see what I'm yeah, saying? It, exactly. Yeah. It's a really long winded way, but, but it's, this is so complex and you, you fundamentally just can't see greenhouse gases. You can see the impact. So like, there's an enormous um, opportunity here to just, fudge data um yeah which is what's happening um or if there's leakage years later there's just no incentive on either side demand or supply to actually ensure quality and the transaction costs of this constant measurement going back after years are so yeah. high that then your profit margins would be incredibly low well, yeah so it's actually not exactly yeah, so right because like the, yeah like the 
some one criticism I've, I've kind of heard of, of kind of applying this kind of market dynamics capitalism to how we trade carbon um, is that it really becomes a race to the bottom. And, you know, to do that stuff where you go back and you look at the actual impact or to run a, a really, uh, you know, in-depth carbon offsetting program, it's expensive or it sounds expensive. But why would you do that if you could just fudge the numbers and, you know, sell them at a price that's, you know, the, the demand is going to eat up, right? Because I imagine that the buyers don't want to pay, you know, a premium for their, their carbon offsets. So how is that supposed to normalize? Like, no, you're that... exactly right. It, it is a race to the bottom and climate targets are set according to um, economics, budgets. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you have this principle called lowest cost abatement. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're you're trying to buy the cheapest reductions possible, and if it's cheaper to buy offsets, then you're not going to make those internal structural um, changes. And if you've set this lowest cost abatement mandate, you're only going to buy the cheapest offsets. Therefore, if you're a seller and you want to have the highest profit margin possible, you're going to cut all sorts of corners, which we see happening all the time. Um, you're not necessarily going to do, you know, it's not just about measurement. It's about doing your due diligence with the landholders, traditional mm -hmm. owners, because we know so many, well, I'd say a majority of carbon credits are generated in the global south. Uh, and that's just going to increase more and more once with this craze for nature-based solutions in inverted commas. And what I mean by that is like protecting forests and, and where are the world's richest forests, you know, they're in, um, the Amazon, Papua New Guinea, um, all the small island developing nations or, or the global south. And so this is, sorry, again, a bit long-winded, but actually getting free prior and informed consent with landholders, proper benefit sharing, um, you know, uh, em employing people, adequately paying them the, the right amount, rigorous measurement, robust independent verification, that's all really, really expensive why would you bother doing that when you can, there's currently no one holding you to account and you exactly, just yeah. forge a whole lot of signatures, which we've seen happen recently in Papua New Guinea with a project, um, and then just make, you know, your profit margins are really high. Yeah, there's no incentives to really play the game fairly, <laughs> it would seem. And so um, kind of moving on the speaking of just about fairness like there's a lot of tech companies that are kind of adopting recently carbon offsetting to kind of claim that they're carbon neutral that they're carbon negative i've seen a lot of big um you know technology providers do this because it, it it looks good right and i think a lot of people a lot of consumers these days like to think of themselves as 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 eco-conscious in some way um from all the discussion we've just had, it doesn't seem that it's it's really as simple as just buying your way out of being a carbon producer, right? Not really, no. And if you're if you're buying vast amounts of carbon credits, that's probably displacing money that could be going into actual investment in clean energy. I'm not saying that's not happening at the same time in the case of some tech companies, um, but yeah, you. You, you can't buy your way out of being a carbon producer. And I think the tech industry accounts for is it, it's somewhere between two, two to three percent of global emissions. Um, and all these big tech companies have made net zero or, or very ambitious carbon negative targets. But it, uh, there's, there's sort of two things there's the report, there's making, setting the target, fine, that's really easy. Um, but there's a lot of variation in how these companies are subsequently tracking. Um, and there's also variation in what they cover in their climate targets. So I think Microsoft has said that it's been carbon neutral since 2012. And please correct me if this is um, inaccurate, but I don't actually think that includes its products. Oh, okay. That 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 2012 car. I, I think now its future climate targets include all its products, which is a major where a majority of all these tech companies' emissions come from. Um, but you know, having said that, there's also that indicates that there's a lack of transparency in a lot of climate plans. You know, a lot of this happens across the board, not just in tech, but you have gas companies saying we're a carbon neutral organisation and you dig a bit deeper into that, which is hard because the reporting is also often very opaque and you find out all they've done is offset the emissions from their office uh, and that allows them to say that their operations are carbon neutral and they're a carbon neutral organisation. So 
<clears throat> there's a lack of yeah the transparency with with reporting and not not just actually the actions and I, th- I think the other thing is that I think I think people just probably even even myself before researching for this episode kind of assumed when a, when a company says that they have a climate plan and they're going to offset all of this stuff I think a lot of people have this vision in their mind that you know they're out there planting forests or they're they're changing to renewable energies not that they can just go and pay you know, a few million dollars or a few billion dollars to, to somebody who is saying, oh, yeah, I'm not going to chop down this forest that was never going to be chopped down anyway. Here's some carbon credits. Like, that's just, I don't think a lot of people understand. <laughs> that, that yeah, that it's is, just, it's just yeah. outsourcing your pollution, really. Yeah. Um, and again, we're experiencing this whole new wave of, of neo-colonialism where a majority of those projects are happening in the global south so you're displacing potentially food production yeah. or now developing countries are going to be having to meet their own climate targets under the paris agreement this gets a little bit technical previously they didn't so they could just afford to sell off their forests to, yeah. to a big polluter in, in a developed nation now they actually have to find the reductions themselves under under this un climate okay. agreement so if big emitters like google reckons it's purchase something like over 20 million tonnes of CO2 reduction, all these big emitters are purchasing tens of millions of tonnes from developing countries. They're actually stopping those countries from making their own reductions. And a lot of those countries are still predominantly dependent on fossil fuels and and the forests are the only place where they can kind of get those climate reductions if you, you know, (laughs) adhere to the the idea that, that you can offset fossil emissions with trees and, and a lot of people say say that you can't yeah that's um, just crazy yeah like i think people don't often think about the externalities of kind of offshoring it like that and just being like out of sight out of mind like yeah wow um yeah it's like australia this is a, a tangent but it's like a, in australia we're constantly pointing to china and saying oh but china's not reducing their emissions you know um <laughs> why should we and then you go yeah but we outsourced all our manufacturing to china of I mean, exactly. China actually is reducing their emissions, but you, why do you think their emissions are increasing, mate? Because you just <laughs> ship them off there. It is. It, it, it's really just a, a shift of blame so that I think people can feel better about themselves. Um, speaking about companies that want to feel better about themselves, <laughs> crypto companies who are notorious, uh, I think, of late for for burning electricity for what, what most people would say isn't very valuable. Um, they've also been getting into carbon offsetting. Um have you have you seen a lot of that? Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> like a few different models of it. You know, there's there's just the offsetting the crypto at face value, um, and obviously crypto has traditionally been an incredibly intensive carbon intensive process. And and I know there's various crypto platforms that claim to be lower energy, and there's mm-hmm. this thing called proof of stake, which I don't claim to know yeah. a lot about, but I get that you reduce it's reducing a lot of energy. Um, you know, but as it, things stand, um, things like Bitcoin and even Ethereum have just been absolutely catastrophic for climate. Yeah. Um, like a combined close to 80 million tonnes of CO2 a year. Um, so obviously the solution before this proof of stake has been to offset. Mm-hmm. And if you, okay, it, even if all the offsets we're talking about are actually legitimate, permanent, additional all those things, mm-hmm. as I said, offsets really only have that super narrow application to some sectors of the economy and as they should be used as a means of last resort. So in an economy-wide sense, there's a lot of really low-hanging fruit that we simply don't need. Like we don't actually need gas and coal in an economy-wide sense for climate. And I'm really sorry, you'll probably agree, a lot of people don't, crypto mining is a, a sector of the economy that we just don't need. Um, right. And it it fries my brain, you know, it's a luxury, really. It is. It fries my brain that this completely unnecessary and completely abstract activity even exists. And then as we'll talk about, like the irony of this system that's running on fossil fuels is not only trying to offset its emissions, um, 
but it's also trying to promote itself as a means to reduce emissions that just which just takes it to the next level like yeah, it's a let, gas let, company let, let, saying let's we're part there. of the climate <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to have uh somebody who i think you know ketan uh joshi on on to do an oh, episode yeah, yeah, yeah. all about all about uh blockchain and, and mining and stuff so i'm excited to, to talk to him about that but I think what you were alluding to maybe was was some of you know uh, carbon trading turning into kind of a hot market of late, and Adam Newman um, of WeWork fame, mm. uh, or kind of infamous for that, uh, is starting a blockchain-based carbon trading platform. Um, yeah, what, what what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so just, I mean, the fact that blockchain is trying to offset its way out of its polluting business is, is bad enough and um, actually had a look at some of the projects that some of these <laughs> blockchain are using as offsets and they're, they're fairly problematic. But then, then you've got this whole other level of someone using blockchain to create what it, it's going to, it's a speculative market that they're creating on what is already a speculative market. So yeah. Systems around carbon credits, as I said, are so speculative and prof profitable that they're completely removed from the material that they're based on. So we don't even talk, we don't even think about carbon reduction when it comes to carbon markets or anymore, um, or, or emissions reductions. It, we spend so much time talking about price and all these these middlemen and and guys like Adam obsess about making profit that we're not even thinking about where the carbon markets are doing what they're designed to do. So they're actually meant to reduce emissions. They're not some sort of lucrative investment opportunity, but we are so obsessed with these market transactions and this is no different. So what actually matters is the reduction of CO2 when the carbon credit is created. Everything after that, afterwards, all the trades doesn't have any benefit for climate. In fact, it's worse if they're used as an as an offset um, yeah. or used to justify ongoing or increasing emissions. But this is where all the money's being made, and this is what people's focusing on. And um, and that's even just assuming that the carbon credit represents a ton of reduction, but most don't. So anyway, sorry, I'm I'm deviating no, probably yeah. into a rant, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this whole framework is completely profit driven. It's it's. But isn't that it's crazy? Gotten, like, we, do you think we're going to yeah. get to a point where? You know, in, in a few years, people will be trading carbon credits just like they trade stocks or, or Bitcoin. Uh, and, you know, people people's retirement funds will have carbon credits in them as an investment tool. Like, is that where we're headed? They already do. That's where we're at. Oh, my gosh. That, that is where we're at. There's um, Ontario Teachers Fund has invested in one of, I would say, in a very questionable uh, carbon aggregator in Australia. But yeah, it's completely lucrative. So, so now crypto proponents are saying, hey, here's a lucrative idea. So let's move carbon credits, which were already fucked. Um, <laughs> you can beep that out if you want onto blockchain and sell them. Like we won't address any of the existing problems, which is whether they're real and whether people are overusing them. We'll just create a whole new set of problems and there'll be no benefits to climate, but there's money to be made. So let's just forge ahead and it's going to be a disaster. So Adam Newman started this thing, Flow Carbon, mm -hmm. which is taking carbon credits, and there's others too, uh, taking carbon credits that already exist, removing them from these vol existing voluntary registries like Vera and Gold Standard, the ones that I mentioned before. They retire them. Um, quite often they bundle different credits together to create a token, and then they sell them on an exchange. So... Um, the reason they say that this is so critical or, or you had a guest a, a week ago, I think, or a couple of weeks ago who said crypto is a solution in search of a problem. Yeah. That Yeah. This is great. This <laughs> is what's happening here. So apparently the problem is that the current carbon credit market is too opaque and trades aren't happening fast enough. It's not liquid, not enough mm -hmm. finance is being given to, pro to projects fast enough. All of that, I would say, is inherently untrue. Um, the idea is that we need to make this this more transparent and accessible to people. But the the irony is, is that by tokenizing, it, removing carbon credits from their registries and tokenizing actually makes the whole process more opaque. So mm -hmm. sure, you can see which tokens have happened. Um, sorry, which which trades have happened, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily know where the credits. Have come from. Um, once you remove them from a registry like Vera or, or Gold Standard, 
those um, certifying bodies it, it can't, won't guarantee them anymore. So VERA has actually stopped this from happening now because it was happening just um, wow. so uh, just in such vast amounts. And and actually, what happened in the case of Toucan, which um, wasn't necessarily tokenizing credits to sell, they were trying to take them off the market mm-hmm. um, and drive the price up and try and make them less accessible to emitters. But what they were doing is actually creating a market for carbon credits that were notoriously so uh, dubious that no one wanted to buy them anyway. So it was actually creating a market that had at, for these credits that were found to be completely fraudulent in 2014 and kind of bringing them back to life and creating a market for them. Oh my um, God. Yeah, it so, reminds me of what, uh, I forget what, I forget what the name of the what, the, what the, there was some acronym they gave them back in the in the housing bubble at you know two thousand and eight, but where they bundled up all the the crappy you know really low scoring mortgages, the subprime mortgages, and they put them in a bundle. Um, and that's then, it. And they yeah, sold that's them, and then they speculated. That's exactly on what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, they're called um, collateralized debt instruments. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah, where, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and. And so Flowship's um, flagship credit, the Nature Goddess token, <laughs> a-, a offers no transparency around that I can see on its website, I should say, from where its credits are from beyond that they have to be kind of naturey because everyone wants to buy nature-based credits now. Sure. And they have to have a certain vintage, which means the year that they were generated. But, yeah, they take them from a whole lot of different projects. And as we know, you really have to scrutinise every single individual project. It's not enough to know that it, this particular method or this particular framework um, has credibility. You really need to look at it at a project level. So um, Flow Carbon's taking several credits, mashing them together to make one token, and, yeah, it, it's bundling them up, as you say. Once you, once you roll them up into a single credit, you don't know what the breakdown of that token is, so you, you really don't know what it is so that's that's the whole irony is that in trying to be more transparent or saying that it's going to be more transparent actually putting credit carbon credits on blockchain makes them less transparent that's crazy i i think it's it's poetic but also depressing that like you know the system of capitalism which kind of led us to the point that, that we're in with a lot of this climate crisis and mass industrialization is now also as we're trying to do something good with with you know to reduce emissions is now you know, people are finding a way to speculate on it to make it hyper capitalistic and probably ruining it in the in the in the process. Like it's just it's just crazy to me. Yeah, I, there's I, a lot to be yeah. said for regulation. Well, yeah. So that leads into my kind of my my next question, which is kind of a, a double question. Like, um, is there? You know, I, I'm sure a lot of this stuff probably started off with good intentions. So, at least I'm I'm going to try and optimistically <laughs> hope that. Um, is there? any such thing as kind of a good carbon credit or a good carbon offset and um i i just on top of that i i had been reading that some people believe that in a way carbon offsetting or the or the ability of kind of creditizing um you know emissions could actually in some ways lead and this might be a kind of pessimistic view but could lead to actual higher emissions because people will be able to emit more and get away with it through the offsets or I'll be able to take two flights instead of one because I can now buy that add-on that that offsets my flight emission. So, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said for putting a price or a tax on carbon, but it has to be high enough that it's a deterrent uh, mm. to, you know, not, not making it cheap enough. So you mm-hmm. have that trade-off of, well, I'll just keep my business as usual model. Um, even if every carbon offset project in the world was legitimate. There just aren't enough trees or mangroves or we just don't have it. We're at the point now, you know, I was talking about additionality before Mm -hmm. where renewable energy isn't considered additional. So that was the biggest proportion of carbon credit, carbon credits previously. Now everyone's looking to, what we call nature-based solutions and that can be anything it's just anything to do with the land um and it's particularly fraught you know it's things like soil storing carbon in soil or trees or whatever um it all all have issues around measurement permanence um additionality but even if they didn't there's just not enough land in the world to offset all the emissions 
all, all the climate targets being set by countries and corporates you know it's great yeah. that everyone's met setting net zero targets yeah i don't know if anyone's ever done a full stock take of <laughs> of what that actually means in terms of how many carbon credits would be needed but the world just doesn't have enough space mm -hmm. to suck up all the carbon that's going to be emitted so personally i'm yet to see a good uh, uh, i don't think i can say 100 percent that there is a good carbon offset project i mean i think the premise of carbon offsetting is quite flawed there may mm -hmm. be good carbon credit projects the difference being is that the credit's generated but you don't use it to justify emitting a ton of co2 yeah and some people think that that's a good way of getting finance into, you know, re restoration or renewable projects um, by by letting them generate credits and, and people having the credits. But it, when it when it's that activity is used to justify polluting and it becomes an issue. So if you had carbon credits that couldn't be used as offsets, that, uh, the offsets I think it would be a lot less prone to rorting. Um, mm. I actually read a paper recently that suggested the best type of offset is political donations and lobbying for rigorous climate policy huh. because that's actually arguing for a structural change in the economy that will mean a whole lot less people are polluting. Um, Absolutely. So, so yeah. It, yeah, I think that's a really important point. Like point. going yeah. back to big tech um, reducing their emissions or setting climate targets, Influence Map did a study of big tech and found that while they talk a really big game on climate, they use less than 6% of the squillions they spend on political lobbying on actually lobbying for environmental or climate policies by their governments. Mm -hmm. So if so much effort and money is spent by businesses trying to look like they're taking action on climate and if they actually were being true to their word and lobbied the government to stop this tiny sector of the economy that underpins our entire global energy system, i.e. fossil fuels, and put their money into other sectors or renewables and R&D into what we call these hard to abate sectors, that would have so much more bang for your buck than, than buying exactly, some yeah. credits from a forest that's just may burn down. Um, going, I guess, you know, bigger picture, the proponents of carbon markets often credit them with increasing ambition of participating parties. But I think generally what we've seen through since the 90s is that carbon markets just give the appearance of everyone doing something about climate change while legitimizing increasing emissions. Um, that's And that's totally the vibe I get. Like the vibe I get is that carbon offsetting is a really, a really convenient way to not be inconvenienced by climate change or having to do actually do anything, especially if, if you have the money to, to do it. So um, that kind yeah, of segues yeah. into, into, you know, on this show, we ask, what is the grift? You know, is it a grift? I, <laughs> I think we've, I think we've determined it kind of is, but um, you know, what is the grift? Like who are the, who are the main offenders here? And like, who's out there making money um, at the end of the day? Yeah, I think, I mean, the grift is that, environmental markets not just carbon markets have manifestly failed to reduce emissions or or improve environmental outcomes after the, over the last yeah. 30 years um but because there's so much money to be made it really hasn't deterred anyone it's like carbon capture and storage manifest failure increases emissions but people just there's people still you know keep <laughs> chucking money out and making money out of it um so since 1850 we've filled our atmosphere with over 2 trillion tonnes of CO2 and half of that, I hope I've got that number right, half of that is in the last 30 years and it's only in the last 30 years that we've had carbon markets. So it, mm. I'm, I'm just trying to point out is that emissions are increasing. We've had carbon, like this year we hit and the we hit a peak in global emissions and yeah. carbon markets are also taking off yet. I'm not seeing any reduction. Um, so I think that's the grift is that we still are sticking resolutely in the private sector and in government to this, what a failing system. Um, yeah. Can I list just a few sub grifts? Yeah, for sure. This is <laughs> I love a good sub grift. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a list of sub grifts. So within this, I think people want to believe that this system can work. You know, I don't think any everyone in involved in carbon markets and carbon carbon offsetting projects is a baddie. Um, mm -hmm. Is actually grifting 
the, the idea that this could be a climate solution is very compelling and it involves trees and mangroves and preserving forests and, um, you know, livelihoods for traditional communities. So yeah. how could that be a bad thing? It, you know, it's really easy if you want to put this kind of in a narrative perspective to frame the fossil fuel industry as baddies. You know, everyone knows that that Shell are baddies and Woodside are baddies, but it's very hard to frame someone who's planting trees or protecting the environment as as a villain. Um, mm. There's this real misconception that the carbon industry has some higher moral purpose, and that's something that uh, I think they capitalise on. Um, sure. And it's confused even more by the fact that you have not-for-profits involved in this space in, in good faith as well. So in Australia, WWF has just started a partnership with a very big carbon developer to save mm. koalas, you know, preserving habitat. Um, the Nature Conservancy is he heavily, develop, um, sorry, heavily involved in, in offset development. Um, Greening Australia, which I think is an NGO in Australia, is planting trees for Woodside. But actually this is a business model that depends on emissions increasing to be successful. Yeah. If that makes sense, you know, they're, they're depending, if they want to scale up that they, they need emissions to increase, to maintain a successful business model. And Oof. in some cases, <laughs> the carbon industry in some in, in instances donates to these NGOs too. Wow. Um, yeah. This space is also get onto the next sub -grift. This space is also really confusing. Um, the technicality mm. of offsetting, coupled with crypto is incredibly complicated. It's really hard to unpack it. You know, you said before, how do you go back and verify yeah. um, whether an offset is, project has done its job? And I think rather than question it, people just get really sucked in and bamboozled by the complex, complexity and the technical yeah. language about it. And, and quite often there's a tendency to say, oh, if I don't understand this, it must be my fault. This must be good. And what I've realised working in the climate space is that the more complicated something gets, is the less likely it is to be effective. Yep. So we actually know what we need to do to stop climate change. We need to stop burning fossil fuels, mm -hmm. like elaborate, complex solutions um, that allow you to keep burning fossil fuels it, <laughs> are just a distraction. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I mentioned a couple of the other sub -griffs before, but <laughs> that like there's no <laughs> there's no incentive on either side of the market here to do the work to ensure that a carbon credit is legitimate so there's yeah. kind of like this gentleman's agreement between supplier and buyer that that this project that if, you know this this credit might be shipped but doesn't actually really matter we've got the piece of paper you know you're not selling a solid object yeah. you're selling a piece of paper and, and you can get anyone to verify that piece of paper one more grief jackson okay um <laughs> <laughs> Keep it coming. A, I mean, there's a lot. I've got more. I've got more. I just <laughs> recognizing that we're, we're running short on time. I think a really big grift is the story that offsets afford a business. So, like I said before, gas companies are buying a tiny amount of offsets, yeah. literally just offsetting their offices, and then saying we're a carbon neutral company. What I think is even more sinister, and a lot of people, um, I think will take issue with this, but gas companies like Santos in Australia, for example, funds mm. Indigenous carbon projects mm. in remote communities, so uh, Indigenous savannah burning projects, which you change the fire regime in the area, mm. and it's providing jobs and livelihoods and getting people back on country. Mm -hmm. But what that allows Santos to do is say, look at this good work we're doing for Indigenous communities. Effectively, I, I see it as colonialism. We're making this Indigenous community dependent on us because... Yeah. If, if you end up calling out the gas, a gas company for greenwashing that is using carbon credits that support Aboriginal communities Ooh, in Australia, yeah. then that risks the income that the Indigenous community is getting. So this is what's called co-benefits in carbon credit, credits. These are the other benefits beyond just that carbon reduction. So um, biodiversity benefits, um, traditional mm -hmm. landholders, you know, jobs for people. Actually, it, it's an incredibly clever tactic on behalf of car the carbon industry and the fossil fuel industry to inject themselves kind of like see as a I'm using a lot of very pejorative language here but like a parasitic wasp kind of yeah. injecting themselves into this bundle of stuff that's really good so if you're if you try and kill the parasite you're killing the host 
Exactly, yeah. So I think a really hard question, and but it's a question that needs to be asked, is what is what is a better way to get money into Indigenous communities? And, like, we should just be giving money to people to live traditionally. Um, exactly, we should just yeah. be giving money for conservation, um, allowing the fossil fuel industry and the carbon industry to kind of base their business model on this, I think, is is particularly sinister. Yeah, it's very insidious. I I, I think it's, it, well, to me, it's, it's just representative of the fossil fuel industry, but I think... Mm. This is, I'm glad that we're having this conversation because I feel like more light needs to be shed on this topic. Um, You know, I was saying earlier, as I kind of scratched at this in my research, I realized, as you were saying, there's so many subgrifts. It it just goes, (laughs) it's a rabbit hole of, of, of so many just different angles. And the fact that it's not really regulated properly just blows my mind. I guess the last question I have for you, and I'm I'm asking this mostly because there's just been so many grifts that I don't want to end on necessarily a negative note, but is <laughs> what, what what's what's happening that maybe a, a, a you know light at the end of the tunnel for this? Like, is there better regulation coming? Are there better international requirements for how we talk about carbon credits coming? What's the solution? Like, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> and if the answer is no, it's we're, we're all screwed. That's fine too. <laughs> The answer is not we're all screwed, but I think this is an area that is just exploding um, and I feel like there's not enough public information, Uh simple public information to show um, the impact that it's having. So the the facts are being misrepresented not only at a project level but at a system level. You know, we can see that emissions are increasing even while carbon markets are increasing. And it would be really great if more people, including NGOs, it was like I said, you know, no one kind of wants to attack this system if it's yeah. nominally good for koalas or, right. or conservation. Like we need more people just calling this out and saying this is an absolute scam. Um, this should be... At, This should be regulated, but actually what we need is just regulation around emissions reduction, emissions reporting, emissions management, um, Mm -hmm. and not even allowing really things to get this bad in terms of offsetting. If If we had a genuine push from the private sector and from governments to actually decarbonize, like this has all come about because we are so captured by the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. If we weren't, if our entire economies in the developed world and, and in the and in the global south weren't completely dependent on fossil fuels you know businesses wouldn't be even having to kind of do this grift yeah, or, exactly, or greenwashing yeah. would be far less an issue so we need to kind of go up next level and and we need the private sector um individuals civil society movements church groups to say just it, we need to stop giving subsidies to fossil fuels. We need to stop being so captured by them. Um, They need to be completely called out because the flow on effects from that will mean that carbon markets like this are, we we don't, we just don't need them. You know, there'll be money to go to renewables. There'll be money to go directly to, to biodiversity conservation um, and things like that. The only people making money from carbon markets are the, the middlemen. Yeah. You know, the benefits sense. aren't flowing to, to communities or, or to the environment. I think what you said, you know, um, you need to, to solve a problem, you need to go to the root of the problem and not just build systems around it to, to mm. try and offset how bad that problem is, you know. So I, yeah, wow. Well, I really appreciate your time. It, it was super great conversation. And uh, I am hoping that there is more and more attention being put on this because, as I said, it's a Pandora's box once you start getting into it. So thank you for helping uh, explain it and uh, walking us through it. appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to my rant. I love the subgrifts too. So. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Polly. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.